Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our second virtual training, Ask About Suicide to Save a Life. My name is Tanya Mack, and I'm with the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at MetroCare. Um, we provide counseling and case management for veterans and their family members, um, regardless of their discharge status or ability to pay. We're so happy that you're here. Um, we've got Charlene Johns of Stop One Suicide to offer this training today, and we are super thankful that she's here. Um, so Charlene, you want to take it? Hey, thanks, Tanya. And thanks for all of you for joining us. We know that these are trying times, and we're trying to stay um, active and help the community stay educated in suicide prevention. Mental health is um, a topic that everyone in the community needs to be aware of, especially in times like these where you can talk to people or you can see their Facebook post and you can say, hey, I think this person is having a hard time. And um, these trainings are meant to equip you and empower you to be able to have those difficult conversations. That's what Stop One is about. It's about letting people know that the statistics of suicide are overwhelming, especially in the veterans community. And yet we want to get people to start thinking about how you can be the one to just stop one. So now that we've got the introductions out of the way, we're glad to see all of you here today. And um, let's get started. This is from the Texas Suicide Prevention Council. It's Ask About Suicide to Save a Life. So we're going to go through the materials. You'll see the PowerPoint presentation online. We did this, uh, we recorded this a little earlier than the live broadcast, but we'll be able to answer your questions. So you can uh, put your questions in the chat box. Everyone will be muted uh, vocally, but you can put your questions in the chat box and we'll um, go through them and answer them at the end. And also, you'll be getting a certificate today. Tanya has the certificates all made up and uh, you can download that certificate and fill in your name that you are uh, uh, certified in this gatekeeper training from the Texas Suicide Prevention Council. So if you're ready, Get your notes out and we'll get started. Let's go, Tanya. All right. Goodness gracious. There you go. Okay, this workshop is presented for information purposes only. And while there's a guarantee that your work today or in the future will save lives. It's built upon research related to best practices of suicide prevention gatekeeper training and has been developed in alignment with these protocols. None of the organizations or workshop leaders assume or convey any warranty of effectiveness, outcomes or reduction in suicide deaths or attempts or adverse workshop outcomes. It's not being delivered in the context of mental health training or clinical care. We recognize that this is hard work and it's a difficult topic. So those who've been exposed to trauma, suicide, loss, lived experience, or similar experiences may find today's discussion difficult. When you're leaving the room, like to get up and change the um, uh, shade in the background like Tanya just did. Please let us know that you're okay with a thumbs up or other signal. Please make eye contact if you can. Uh, we wanna make sure that um, you have the support you need. The suicide prevention hotline is 800-273-8255. And if you're a veteran or a veteran family member, you can press one. So please, um, take advantage of the suicide hotline if you need to. Uh, the workshop is not de designed to be delivered by a clinical care provider. It is designed to not to not designed to serve as a diagnose, diagnosis, screen, treat, or otherwise um, any kind of counsel for medical, med mental health or physical mental health condition. But feel free to reach out to Tanya or the staff at Cohen Clinic if you have any concepts any concerns or questions. And again, we'll take your um, questions offline uh, during the break. So the Ask Workshop agenda. 
is to see the key points. We're going to give you an introduction and workshop overview, the epidemiology of suicide, the public health approach to suicide, which is part of what you're taking part in today, and that is that people in the community learn how to recognize a mental health crisis. This template is modified to also include veteran statistics. Today we want to spend some time learning about things you can and should do to help reduce the risk of suicidal behavior among people that you're coming in contact with. First, it's helpful to know the basic information about suicide risk and protective factors and the warning signs. And then second, it's important to know what's expected of a gatekeeper and how gatekeeper skills fit into suicide prevention. Third, your potential to help someone at risk of suicide is dependent upon knowing that suicide can be prevented. Fourth, we're going to work to ensure that you're confident in your ability to act in the event that you suspect someone might be at risk. And finally, know how to connect someone who may be at risk to qualified care. These are the skills we're going to be working on today. The original ASK curriculum was developed as a collaboration across a number of experts in the health and suicide prevention field who are listed here. This updated and enhanced ASK is built off this best practice and form foundation and has expanded to include information that's recently emerged through newer research and information. So gatekeeper training is designed to help key people identify and refer people who might be at risk for suicide. The purpose is to teach these people how to respond to suicidal behavior, express suicidal intent or other crisis that someone they know might be experiencing. This is a commonly implemented strategy to ensure that key people know how to respond when someone's in crisis. This slide gives an overview of the widespread use of ASK model since its inception in 2005. Approximately 20,000 have attended ASK gatekeeper workshops delivered in person by a workshop leader who completed this intensive training of workshop leader curriculum. Over 400, 401 trainers have been delivered to ASK. In addition, over 15,000 have launched the online version of ASK since August 2018 when it became available. Many gatekeeper trainings, including ASK, are adapted for special audiences such as youth, veterans, older population, and the like. More training options are listed on the website above. As we mentioned, the original ASK curriculum is based on best practices for gatekeeper training. The original ASK curriculum is listed in the SPRC research as a program uh, and the program website. Numerous literature reviews and studies have found that suicide prevention gatekeeper training as promising practices when combined together with larger systems approaches to suicide prevention. So gatekeeper training holds the promise as part of a multifaceted strategy to combat suicide it's been proven to positively affect the skills, attitude, and knowledge of people who undertake training in many settings. In the context of our communities, suicide prevention gatekeeper training is a valuable resource. And you can see from this graphic that suicide prevention isn't just one thing. It takes effort across a number of strategies, systems, participants to impact suicide prevention outcomes. Gatekeeper training sits at a critical juncture where community members interact on a daily basis, well, after the shelter in place. But gatekeeper training isn't the only solution. It's part of a larger suicide safe care strategy that's needed across our communities. However, it is the place to start Evaluating awareness of risk factors, warning signs, and protective factors to help identify people who may be at risk and guide them into qualified care. First, it's important to know that 
all 50 states have some form of suicide prevention statewide plan. Most conform or align with the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention, as well as the Defense Department and Department of Veterans Affairs. In addition to the state plans for suicide prevention and National Strategy for Suicide Prevention, there are other helpful tools such as the Center for Disease Control's technical package for suicide prevention. Finally, it's also important to note that the VA and the Department of Defense also have system-wide plans in place with the national strategy. The point is that states are working together with federal, state, and local partners to align and leverage vital resources to improve suicide prevention outcomes. These plans that we just discussed are a vital way to ensure that the collective impact of the important suicide prevention work underway across the country. This slide highlights several of the partners who are anchoring this work. There may be many more in communities across the community. Again, the point is gatekeeper trainings like ASK is one tool being used to help make communities suicide safer. There's a saying that's going around from the American Association of Suicidology. Suicide prevention is everyone's business. This is true. Anyone who's interacting at any level with other people, which means all of us, is likely to encounter someone who may be at risk of suicide at some point in our lives. The logic of gate, the gatekeeper model is that adults who come in contact with persons at risk should know clearly what they should do if they encounter someone who might be suicidal. However, the model inherently assumes, as we discussed earlier about suicide safe care systems, that there are qualified and supportive services available to that system and it's in place to enable the gatekeeper to make the appropriate referral and transfer care. The gatekeeper model assumes that persons who are at risk for suicide are more likely to be identified and more likely to receive effective care if a person is trained as a gatekeeper comes in contact with them. Because it's believed that the heightened sense of suicidality is often a short period of time, we'll discuss this a little later, any intervention during this period can be helpful. So think of suicide prevention gatekeeper training like CPR. If you were to have a heart attack, which city would offer the best chance of survival? Did you know that it's Seattle? Because Seattle offers that best chance of survival because it has the highest number of residents trained in CPR. Think of it this way. You're more likely to die from a heart attack. You're is before you arrive at the hospital. So if through CPR, we can keep people alive until qualified help arrives, the better your chances of survival are. That's how to think about gatekeeper training. The time someone's most likely to die by suicide is not when you're in the office of a mental health professional. It's when you're in the community. So next, let's look at what do we know about suicide. In 2017, over 47,000 Americans died by suicide. When estimated suicide attempt figures are added to the equation, it's easy to see how communities are impacted by suicide. We'll talk more about this in a moment. The cost to the U.S. economy is staggering. The CDC estimates that nearly $70 billion in cost. The firearms are the leading method of suicide, accounting for over 50% of all suicide deaths. The rates are highest for non-Hispanic whites. To understand the magnitude of suicide in the United States, it helps to get a visual image. Picture an average high school football field. The average school football stadium seats around 4,000 people. Now picture 
12 stadiums full of football fans for an illustration of the number of people that die each year in the United States. That's close to 48,000 people. So according to the CDC Whispers database, suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages between 10 and 35. It's the fourth leading cause of death for ages 35 to 54, and the eighth leading cause of death for ages 55 to 64. The highest rates of suicides are in the middle ages and in the elderly. White, non-Hispanic men account for the majority of suicide deaths in these categories. The annual number of people who die by suicide is greatly exceeded by the number of people who attempt suicide but do not die. For every suicide death, there are approximately three hospitalizations for an attempt, nine emergency visits for an attempt, and 27 attempts that do not result in hospitalization or emergency department visits. So as you can see by this graph, the number of suicide deaths is really the tip of the iceberg in a much larger array of suicidal activity in the United States. The SDCR, using the 2017 data generated by the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System, indicated that female teenagers are nearly twice as likely to consider suicide, plan a suicide, attempt suicide, and experience an attempt so severe that medical attention is required. Thoughts and attempting among suicide uh, high school students is higher than among adults in general, although death among that bracket is, is, is lower. So the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System, it's a national effort to gather information on a wide range of factors to pertinent to youth health and well-being. So what do we know about suicide in our state? If you're listening from outside of Texas, thank you. But today we're just looking at Texas data. And all of this information is available from the America Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So in 2017, which is the last number of days the data is aggregated for, Texas experienced over 3,700 suicide deaths, more than two times more suicides than homicides. According to the 2017 CDC Whispers data, 3,778 Texans died by suicide death. 3,766 died in motor vehicle accidents, but 1,653 died as a result of homicide. So in Texas and the United States, there are more suicides than homicides every year. The highest rate of deaths by suicide, and that the rate is numbers per 100,000 is among seniors in Texas, but for U.S. overall, the highest rate is among those that are middle-aged. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for older teens, college-age youth, and young adults, and the third leading cause of death among young teens. While unintentional injury accounted for the majority of injury deaths in Texas, suicide accounts for nearly 25% of these deaths. And note that Texas experienced more than twice as many suicides than homicides. We also know something about the prevalence of suicide across age and sex of Texans. There's a clear difference between male and female suicide rates. By looking at this trend in rates, we can see how suicide is changing in our state. To illustrate the importance and magnitude and the prevalence of suicidal behavior, consider Texas um, 2017 results. In the previous 12 months, Texans high school students indicated that 17.8% were seriously thinking about suicide. 14% of those kids made a plan. 12 
25% made an attempt. In an average class of two, 25 students, at least one has made an attempt so severe it required medical intervention. <clears throat> now compared to the national average, Texas high school students had a consistently higher rate of attempting suicide. In 2017, the Texas rate was 66% higher than the national average. Although suicide is a tragedy, which affects all population groups across all socioeconomic levels, research indicates several special populations that may have an elevated risk for suicide. So it's especially important to consider this in combination with other risk factors. These can include people with a, uh, a history of suicide attempts, just as we discussed, people who have a history of mood disorders, service members, veterans, and their families, LGBT populations, American Indian and Alaska Native populations, older males, especially non-Hispanic whites, and exposure to adverse childhood events and or other traumatic experiences. Emerging research has also appears to indicate certain professions appear to be higher risk for suicide. These professions include those who have had exposure to trauma and those who may have ready access to lethal means, first responders, healthcare professionals, veterinarians, construction, mining, and agricultural professions. So data shows that across all ages, more males die by suicide, but more females attempt suicide. Why would you think that more males die by suicide, but more females attempt? Well, the answer is that women use less lethal means as more males attempt with firearms and than with females. And while nationwide, the statistics show that veterans, that firearms make up 50% of suicides, in the veteran population, firearm suicides make up 79% of all suicides. We'll discuss this in more detail in the upcoming slides. For youth, Latina teens have a higher average suicide rate. For youth, one of the most highest self-reported attempts in the United States are Latina female teens, and the highest death rate for both teens and adults is for white males. Also note that recent years have some death rates increased for young African American children. But now let's take a look at the veteran data. Older veterans account for 65% of veterans who die by suicide. Overall, the risk is compared to the, gen to the general population is 21% higher. This graph shows that while the high rate of suicide is highest among veterans age 18 to 39, Again, that's the rate per 100,000. The number of veterans that is highest in the over 60 group. Historically, military service was considered a protective factor in the context of suicide prevention. But in recent years, this trend has shifted significantly. A 2009 study looked at the vital status of 1.3 million veterans from their time of discharge through 2009. Key findings include that deployed veterans had a lower risk of suicide to non-deployed veterans. Rate of suicide was highest during the first three years of leaving military service. The overall suicide rate for the U.S. veteran population is 35.6 per 100,000, but the rate for women veterans is 2.5 times higher than the civilian female population. 
military sexual trauma survivors have had a higher rate of suicide than women veterans who did not report MST. Rural veterans are 28% of all veterans and 20% of the population. But among VA enroll enrollees, 41% of those are in rural areas. Rural vet veterans have a 20% increased risk of death by suicide after um, controlling for access to care, demographic factors, and diagnosis. The higher the level of the population, the level of rurality, the smaller the population density, which makes the suicide rate higher in that area. Reasons for this statistic include access to care, less job opportunities, poor housing opportunities, et cetera, that can drive a higher rate of suicide. There are also benefits, including ingenuity, hardiness, and adaptation. Resilience, including local access to role models and peers and culture. This graph shows the Texas County trends versus veterans and non-veterans. While rates are higher than the national average, rates among the Army, active duty, and guard components, as well as the Air National Guard, are particularly high. Men are more likely than women to die by suicide, though they're less likely to attempt suicide. Most suicide deaths involve firearms. Most non-fatal suicides are utilized poisoning. Some social demographic characteristics are more strongly associated with attempted suicide deaths than others. We discussed occupations, invisible illnesses, casual connections to mental and physical health, chronic pain, exposure to trauma, and ad adverse childhood events, among other factors. However, persons of all characteristics are at risk at some level. From a public health perspective, which means that we consider the health of the population as a whole system, Suicide is considered one of the more preventable deaths when it's part of an overall prevention, intervention, and postvention strategy. And we can recognize and lower risk factors, support protective factors, recognize warning signs, and know how to connect someone who's at risk to care. For those of you unfamiliar with the term public health, it generally means that society's organized and coordinated efforts to prevent health problems. Help support effective prevention by developing the skills promoted by the ACT. In today's model, we're going to learn to ask about suicide, seek more information, safety first strategies, the importance of securing lethal means, and knowing how to connect someone at risk. Why are risk factors so important? Much of our day is based on risk factors, protective factors, and warning signs. These are the fundamental elements to suicide prevention. The question is why? Why are they so important? Suicide is multifactorial, as noted here by the World Health Organization. It's complex, involving several interacting factors that are not often visible to the people around someone at risk. Therefore, knowing the risk factors, the protective factors, and the warning signs is a critical step in helping connect someone at risk to the care that they need the most. So let's define those terms using the definition. Risk factors are characteristics that make it more likely that an individual will consider, attempt, or die by suicide. The protective factors are characteristics that make it less likely 
that individuals will consider attempt or die by suicide. It's not cause and prevent, but it's more likely and less likely. So there's key differences between risk factors and warning signs. Risk factors, that indicates someone that's at a heightened risk for suicide, but indicate little or nothing about immediate risk. For example, nationally, middle-aged, non-Hispanic white males have the highest rate of suicide death. Based on this information, middle-aged, non-white Hispanic males are at a heightened risk for suicide. However, this tells us little or nothing about immediate risk. So the warning signs indicate an immediate risk of suicide. From the organization saying, warning signs of suicide are indicators that a person might be in acute danger and may urgently need help. For example, talking about or wanting to die or kill themselves. Consider this example for distinguishing between risk factors and warning signs. Back to our middle-aged white non-Hispanic male. He has a risk factor because of age and sex and ethnicity, and he's exhibiting warning signs that he's talking about wanting to die. So let's look at this graph comparing risk factors and protective factors to help us understand the distinction. Let's look at this chart. So from a health public health perspective, we're generally more familiar with the public education on heart disease, risk factors, protective factors, and warning signs. So you can see the list of heart under heart attack. But now let's look at the risk factors of suicide. The risk and protective factors are found at various levels from individuals, families, and community. And they also have variable characteristics. They can be fixed. That means things that they cannot change, family, like a family history of suicide or trauma experience. But then there's modifiable things that can be changed, such as treating a mood disorder or reducing stressors, such as unemployment and homelessness. In suicide prevention, we try to lower risk factors. So those risk factors are the characteristics that make it most likely that individuals will consider, attempt, or die by suicide. So what are some of those risk factors? The slide shows us prior suicide attempts, mood disorders, substance use disorders, access to lethal means. And we'll discuss each of these. So in several studies of suicide, one of the strongest uh, predictors is a previous suicide attempt. However, it's important to note that 9 out of 10 persons who have previously attempted suicide do not go on to die by suicide. If you're aware that someone has made a previous attempt, um, it's very important to consider that as a risk factor. Research appears to make a strong connection between mood disorders and risk factor suicide. So according to Mental Health America, the figure is estimated as up to 70%. Again, suicide is a multifactorial, and, and while mood disorders appear to elevate the risk, it is not solely the cause of suicide. Substance use disorders, encompass a wide range of substance types, and there's a wide variety of types. For example, alcohol intoxication is present in over one-third of suicide attempts. Alcohol misuse indicates a higher risk, as high as 10 times the percent of the general population. Persons who inject drugs are about 14 times greater risk of suicide. So uh, examples of substance use include alcohol, pres prescription medication, over-the-counter medication, marijuana, amphetamine. Now, the discussion about substance use disorder relative to suicide attempts and deaths is important because the prevalence of, of substances found in suicide attempts. So as, 
If a person is under the influence of any substance, the risk is elevated. Nearly a quarter of a million emergency department visits resulted from drug-related suicide attempts, and nearly all involved either a prescription or over-the-counter medication. So easy access to those lethal means heightens the risk of dying by suicide. This chart illustrates the acute period of heightened risk for suicide, and it's often only minutes or hours long. Access to lethal means during this acute period can increase the likelihood of a fatal suicide attempt. So there's hundreds of risk factors um, for suicide. This is not a comprehensive list, but remember that risk factors do not predict suicide. However, the knowledge of risk factors help us understand which individuals may become psychologically distressed and consider suicide. For instance, trauma and PTSD, as well as a history of, uh, of abuse or bullying. The Veterans Administration's research identified chronic pain also as a risk factor for suicide. A family history of suicide is a risk factor, but does not predict suicide. It might indicate a lack of family support or a family's inability to recognize and address mental health substance use disorder. People who have experienced a loss by suicide may be at elevated risk. Loss is frequently cited as a factor. Job, death of a family member or friend, a relationship, pets, and other loss experiences elevate risk. A person's support system can be disrupted during life transitions. The disruption of support comes at a time when there's a high need for connectedness during adjustment period. Legal, law enforcement, and judicial involvement is also connected to elevated risk. Law enforcement is often the first point of contact for a person at risk for suicide. The Center for Disease Control specifies that a cluster has occurred when attempts and or deaths are at a higher number than normally would be expected for a specific population. So sensational media reporting or recent media portrayals of suicide, such as 13 Reasons Why, may elevate the risk as well. So let's look at the key points on protective factors. They're the positive conditions, personal and social resources that promote resiliency and reduce potential for suicide, as well as other high-risk behaviors. So what are some of those examples of protect protective factors? Not everyone who has a mood disorder thinks about or acts out suicidal behavior. So the, here's four major protective factors. Connectedness to individuals, family, community, and social institutions, problem-solving skills, contacts with caregivers, and effective mental health care. Lethal means safety is also a significant protective factor, but we'll be covering this in more detail a little bit later. So connecting to friends and family, community, social institutions, and other environments are important in developing connectedness. And we know that during this time, we're thankful for things like Zoom and Facebook Live that can promote those connections. So several programs have been shown to decrease suicidal thought and behavior include elements to pertain to connectedness. As mentioned in the National Strategy, Connected was also one of the main components for post-crisis suicide prevention programs. The CDC is promote, promoting individual, family, and community connections to prevent suicide has detailed strategy and researches this topic. Connecting to friends and family, community, social institutions, and other environments, that's important. So people with physical or psychiatric conditions 
may have increased risk for suicide, and that can often be effectively treated or managed in a way to reduce suicidal behavior. The national strategy um, dedicates substantial attention to improving treatment and support services for people at risk, and the Zero Suicide Initiative is the epicenter for this important work. It's important to treat any underlying condition as well as deploying strategies that directly address the suicide risk. A person with skills involving problem solving or resolving conflict may find it very difficult to manage situations. By helping them to develop these types of skills, they can be better able to successfully navigate difficult situations or conflict in their relationship without developing a sense of frustration and hopelessness. Being a member of a community or a family that discourages suicide and promotes social integration can be protected. Improved problem solving skills, increases resiliency, and coping strategies for people who might be at risk for suicide. Further, because suicidal behavior is often aligned with other concerns, such as mood disorders like depression, substance abuse, improving their resiliency and coping strategies can have a positive impact. So those protective um, factors, let's look at that. That's contact with caregivers. Caring contact provides an ongoing opportunity to offer support for somebody who might be at risk. Regular interval outreaches and contact is demonstrated to improve suicide prevention outcomes. So this is a good time to reach out to people, message people that um, you might have that thousand friends on Facebook, but how many are you really talking to? So now is a good time to reach out. While primary tar targeting clinical um, environments such as emergency department and clinical staff, regular points of outreach via phone and text and postcard can be also used. So these warning signs are from the AFSP. You can also download a PDF of this warning signs from our stop1.info website. Warning signs are especially important in the gatekeeper role because these are things that we can observe. So this America Foundation for Suicide Prevention lists three different categories of warning signs. Uh, talk related to suicide, behavioral change, and moods. So any of these warning signs should prompt you to immediately call the number for the National Suicide Prevention Line. Why don't you get out your phone right now or a piece of paper and write that number down. 800-273-8255. Veterans can press 1 to talk to a mental health professional. Now keep in mind that a person who is uh, suicidal might not directly communicate about how they're feeling or thinking. This next slide shows that how those examples can be communicated in multiple ways. So in fact, as you're speaking with them, they might not even have a clearly formed thought on plans of attempting suicide, but their risk might be leading them in that direction. So clearly, if some person is uh, direct and forthright about having suicidal thoughts, their uh, action is called for, and probing becomes less relevant. However, vague statements that could allude to suicidal intent are most likely an invitation on the part of you to ask that person for more questions. So the indirect examples is like, I just want out, I can't take it anymore, they're feeling trapped. People would be better off without me, that's perceived burdensomeness. Sometimes I just want to go to sleep and not wake up, thoughts of death. You can further that conversation by asking about suicide. So our next shows the warning signs of behavior. So warning signs that can also be communicated by a person's behavior is they can have these indirect statements, but that also uh, they might start act, acting differently. 
so it's incumbent that we need to scan for signs or cues that might indicate potential suicidal thinking. And this slide shows a few of those behaviors. Now, behaviors that are new have increased or seem related to a painful event, loss, or change are of particular concern. And this uh, current circumstance that we find ourselves is certainly one of those new um, situations. However, the tipping point doesn't cause the suicide. It's a proximal risk factor. So that you can see the uh, potential risk factors. I think we should add pandemic up there as well. So let's um, move on. And the bottom line really is trust your instinct. If the thought of suicide crosses your mind, assume that it's crossed the mind of the person that you're talking to. And it should be emphasized again that there's really not one risk factor that will allow you to know someone's at risk for suicide. Rather, a person in psychological distress will have a combination of those warning signs. So look for multiple signs, not just one. And the higher the underlying risk factors, the lower the protective risk factors, and the more warning signs show or communicated, the higher the overall risk for suicide. Bottom line, again, trust your instinct. So here's the ask model. Some variation of these steps are usually a part of any suicide gatekeep gatekeeper prevention training. These steps allow anyone to become a suicide gatekeeper These, and help someone who's at risk of suicide. If you're not providing or you're not providing or expected to provide um, clinical diagnosis or mental health care, it does help support someone who might be struggling and offer opportunities to connect with appropriate care. Think back to that heart attack example of CPR, your life CPR, doing what you can to connect someone to appropriate care. And one of the things that I appreciated about this about learning CPR was the first thing that they started told uh, uh, this class was Start yelling out, dial 911, dial 911, dial 911, until someone calls 911, because you can't keep up that level of CPR to keep that person alive. You are trying to get them to appropriate help. So the first thing is, what's the first step in saving a life? Asking about suicide does not put the thought of suicide in someone's head. It does give that person a sense of relief. If you use the word suicide, it gives them that sense that you're not going to turn away or you're not going to judge them. You're not going to condemn them if they say, yeah, I have been thinking about suicide. Things are really bad. And it gives, ask, is this process to offer hope to someone to help prevent the tragic loss of suicide? not to provide counseling for clinical treatment. So where do you start? Um, if something doesn't seem right, based on what you're observing or hearing, starting with a simple inquiry in their well-being may be enough to get a dialogue going. Oftentimes the impulse leads to inquiry is a fast, yeah, yeah, like we all do every day when someone asks us how we're doing. But they're then it's important to use a follow-up and ask again, like, are you sure you're okay? Because I've started to be a little concerned about some of the things you've been saying. So find out if the person is open to a private conversation. You don't need to say this in a chat room with a bunch of people. You can take it um, to where you're not going to shame that person in front of uh, other people. So let's make a connection. Find a private way to talk and establish that caring connection. 
it's important that they feel like they can speak to you in privacy without anyone knowing what they're saying or being ashamed. So to begin a conversation, can communicate that you care about them and that's what your goal is, to keep them safe. And acknowledge that everybody faces challenges or difficulties that allow them to see you as a person with feelings and problems as well. You can begin to express ob observations like, I sense you're feeling really down today. Is that is that true? And you seem really stressed. Are you okay? Or you don't seem like yourself lately. Can we talk? So it seems like you're dealing with a lot right now. How have you been coping? If you suspect someone might be at risk, it's important that you ask them about suicidal thoughts, behaviors, and plans. In asking them, depending on the context of your relationship, ask directly about suicidal thoughts or plans. Discuss ways of asking about suicide. So let's stress that what you say, how you say it might not be perfect, but it's important that you actually ask directly about suicide. Are you thinking about suicide? If you ask that person the question and they say no, but you're still concerned that they're at risk, ask it again in another conversation. So how do you go about doing that? If you suspect someone might be at risk, it's important that you ask about their behavior, their suicidal thoughts, and plans. Asking them, of course, depends on the context and your relationship. But stress, we want to ask how you're doing. And if the person says no, again, ask a little later in the conversation. Be aware of your tone, your voice, and your body language on how you ask the question. Stay caring and non-judgmental. Your words don't have to be perfect, but it is important to ask, and it is important to use the word suicide. If you need help asking, the Lifeline can support you through the ask process if the person is open for it. You can make the call to the hotline, and you can have your friend on the line. Be aware of your tone and your the tone of your voice and your body language and how you ask those questions. Stay caring. Stay non-judgmental. Don't say, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? Are you crazy? Yeah, that would not be helpful. Or, you wouldn't do anything stupid, would you? This leads the person to the conclusion that you really don't want to hear how they're feeling. And you can't handle it if they tell you the truth. So if they see suicide as the only solution, they will not perceive as it as being something stupid or hurtful. They see it as a solution to a problem. So if you're uncomfortable with asking and you suspect someone's at risk, you can find a way that, to connect that person at risk with the hotline and protect them against suicide. The National Suicide Hot Lifeline is 800-273. 8255. So the first thing you want to do is acknowledge the response if the person says yes or no. And then the second thing is do your best to neutralize, to be neutral on the subject of suicide and not imply that the person is wrong or bad or stupid for thinking about suicide. If that answer is yes, Acknowledge there's a lot of pain and suffering involved in getting to the point of contemplating suicide. Their situation must really be overwhelming. So acknowledging that conversation by saying, thank you for sharing and trusting me. I'm concerned about your situation. I can see your in tremendous pain and, and how you could get to this point. So, or how you might be thinking about suicide. Seek more information. So after you've asked the question about suicide and you have a sense of the person's situation, it's time for the first of the three S's and ask. Seek more information. So using active listening techniques to learn more about a person's story 
Um, active listening involves a wide range of skills, hearing, body language, verbal responses, and nonverbal gestures. Active listening uses open-ended questions to allow the person at risk to share their thoughts and feelings. People in psychological distress, they're often focused on or overwhelmed by multiple issues and may perceive suicide as a solution. So remember, suicide is multifactorial. They're not seeing or perceiving their situation clearly. So active listening is vital for you to understand what they're saying. So here's the five key points in active listening. One, put down your phone. Pay attention. Give the person your undivided attention and acknowledge the message. Look at the speaker and avoid being distracted. Show that you're listening. Nod occasionally. Make sure your posture is open and interested. Provide feedback. So reflect on what's being said. Like what I heard you say is, and then reflect that back to them. Ask questions that can clarify certain points and summarize the speaker's comments periodically. So don't interrupt with counter argument. But have you thought about this? I mean, why are you thinking about it when you've got so much to live for? Allow the speaker to finish their thought and then respond appropriately and be candid about what you observe. Thank the person for sharing that information. So, a lot of you are finding uh, solace with your pet. So here's a little uh, pet with a little headphones on. So in uh, we're gonna. This is our uh, live training opportunity, and um, this is the ex interactive exercise. So we're gonna blow past that interactive exercise, and we're gonna give you things that you can actively listen for. Well, we don't want to bombard a person at risk with a comprehensive series of questions. Uh, we simply want them to get them to talk and know they're connected to someone who cares. At the same time, we're looking for information about their situation. So actively listen to what they're distressed about. Have they talked to anybody else? And have they been in this situation before? And what has worked in the past? So pay attention to your body language and your responses. Most importantly, stay calm and stay present. So as we discussed earlier, there are some key warning signs and risk factors that are particularly important when engaging someone who might be at risk of suicide. While we don't want to interrogate them, uh, listen carefully for any of those warning signs that we discussed earlier today. Seek to find if a person is at immediate risk for suicide. If so, take immediate action. You can call 911, you can call the suicide hotline, but it's important that you respond and take it seriously. Do not expect to handle this alone, just like CPR. It takes more than one person. So it's important to connect to qualified care if someone is in immediate or serious risk of suicide. These are the suicide hotline. Seek to find out if the person's at immediate risk, take immediate action. Um, if you're meeting with someone, it's best to choose physically connect them to care. If not, expect to handle this just like CPR and connect them to a qualified professional. Always protect yourself safety first. It's a critical element in suicide prevention, working with someone that you think might be at risk. So making someone at risk promise um, to be safe is not effective. Safety planning is a critical step when someone's at risk because it assists them in developing the elements here like coping strategies, support, resources. Stanley and Brad have developed a protocol for safety planning, which is an excellent step in learning more. Here's some safety first things to know. Safety is a critical element in providing suicide prevention when working with somebody that might be at risk. So we can help ensure safety by connecting them with support systems. 
and by engaging them uh, with those that can help. It shows three levels of a person at risk. So now, so now the key points to ensure those safety tips are connect them to a support system. Connect, connecting them to support conveys the message that help is available and safety is a critical element in suicide prevention. We can help assure their connectedness by um, seeing the list. And if you perceive that they're in an immediate danger, again, don't hesitate to call 911. Do not leave someone who is at risk alone, but always ensure that you're safe. In rural, in rural areas, pastors often serve as the mental health providers. Our next slide is uh, the interactive exercise number two. And since we don't have a lot of interaction, we'll look at securing access to lethal means. So why do you think this image, the image with the at and the lock on it, is um, chosen as the theme on access to lethal means? So how many, I mean, everyone here has more than one password on their computer or phone. So we're working incredibly hard in securing our virtual world, passwords, inscriptions, two-factor authentications, and the like. But the fact is that most households have highly lethal means unsecured. So being aware of what those lethal means are and the accessibility to it can help reduce the risk of someone who is suicidal. So what can we do? As you see in the next few slides, all methods of suicide are not created e equally. Highly lethal means is a critical determinant in suicide attempts and suicide death. An example that we, uh, an example is that we know more males die by suicide, but more females attempt. And why do more men die? Because of firearms, they're using a more lethal means. So while the action doesn't change the fundamental action for someone at risk, it can reduce the suicide attempt. So if you look at this graph, firearms are a significant factor in suicide death. This shows firearms at 50.6%, but in veterans, that number is 79%. So it's they account for nearly double of all the suicide deaths next to the closest method that this is not the case for suicide attempts. So as you can see on the next slide, um, those who survive a suicide attempt, only 1% were firearmed. So as a result, the lethality of the method selected and the proximity of that method are compelling factors in suicide deaths or attempts. Why are medications highly lethal means? So Elaine Frank, the co-creator of Counseling on Access to Lethal Means Training, um, which we do provide through Military Veteran Peer Network, medications are the most frequently used method <coughs> excuse me, in suicide attempts. Medications and combination medications can be highly lethal. Availability is, uh, they are available in most terms. And some unused or expired medications might not be secured. So the data chart shows that based on the Whiskers data, it illustrates Elaine's point. Of poisoning deaths, the majority utilized medications. Poisoning accounted for 14% of suicide deaths in 2017. This accompanying bar graph also shows that the contributions of various substances uh, to poisoning suicide. The anesthetics and narcotics account for nearly half, 60% uh, of poisoning deaths. Why do firearms matter most? Firearms are the leading method of suicide deaths nationally and in Texas. They are highly lethal and often accessible in many homes. They are fast and irreversible, making the need to put time 
and distance between someone at risk of suicide and their access to those legal means critically important. As you can see, putting time and distance between someone at risk of suicide and a highly legal means can help save a life. While this training wasn't designed to equip you with those skills, it's important to know the role legal means has in safety. For more information about the COM training, visit the SDR web see our website and search for COM. You can also find information on COM on stopworm.info. Know how and where to connect. So the final steps in the ask process is to know how and where to connect to someone at risk for qualified care. This requires some work on your part. Finding out who in your community, in your state and national or recognize accessible resources to assist you when you encounter someone at risk for suicide. These connections should be to qualified mental health professionals, ideally trained in suicide prevention and in best practices. So please, if you didn't do this before, take out your cell phone and put this number in, 800-273-8255 into your phone because that is the Suicide National Hotline. These um, are some suicide prevention partnerships. So nationally, there's a wide range of immediately available resources. All of these resources are available 24-7. There's also many elevated risk groups, disaster impacted and service members and veterans. Several of those are listed here. So it might be helpful to connect and contact the service programs that you will be referring to. So, in many states, 211 is a place for connecting to mental health providers and mental health resources. So, you can be sure to go through 211 as well. So, as an example, in Texas, all local mental health facilities are required to provide 24 hour crisis line. So you can also get those crisis line numbers and what's available in our area. We will have that um, provided to you as a document at the end of this training. So first responders and mobile crisis outreach teams. In an immediate risk situation, call 911, your local police, camp campus police or sheriff's office, or go to the nearest emergency room department. Many areas also have mobile crisis outreach teams that are especially equipped for mental health crisis. Remember, you're dealing with someone under duress and you might have to lead them and guide them into appropriate care. Help them call a friend, help them call a family member, but again, being there is very important. Your goal is to keep them safe. So what else can you do? follow up, stay in touch, let the person know your care, know the public and private sector resources. Suicide prevention coalitions are a great way to improve collaboration in creating suicide safer communities. So for some organizations, um, there are other mechanisms that they uh, improve data and information sharing. Remember, suicide prevention covers a wide spectrum of activities and always follow safe messaging guidelines and help your community and media outlets to report safely on suicide. Remember, you can save a life. You can stop one. So ask about suicide. Seek more information. Safety first. Secure legal means. Know how and where to refer. So by following this ASK protocol, you have the skills needed to do basic gatekeeping for suicide prevention in your community. Thank you for participating in today's workshop and what you're doing to make the community safer. Here's the resources in Texas. And uh, the National Suicide Prevention Wi-Fi. And you can also take the um, QPR code. The Survey Monkey will post that at the end and you can put in 
um, your comments on this training. Thank you again so much, and we'll take your questions now.